Good evening. Good evening and welcome very, very much to Conversations, where I'm pleased to welcome to the program Monsignor Robert Call. And uh, Monsignor Call is the, Call is the uh, executive director of an extremely interesting and helpful agency here uh, in this year, 1988, uh, called the Interfaith Hunger Appeal. And Monsignor, welcome very, very much to Conversations indeed. Uh, it's good to be with you, Harold. I Appreciate wonder, it. Not at all. Our pleasure. And I wonder if you might share this in the Interfaith uh, Appeal. When it got started, in the agencies that are involved and so forth, a little historical development. Well, in 1978, Catholic Relief Services joined with the American Jewish Joint Distribution Committee mm -hmm. and with Church World Services. And later, uh, in 1984, mm -hmm. uh, Lutheran World Relief joined the organization. Mm -hmm. The purpose of the organization was to, to uh, develop uh, a more sophisticated understanding on the part of the American people concerning global hunger. All right. To see it not just as a, an act of God, but as the result of the human conditions. Yeah, well, we were so much aware of that 70, uh, in, in the years when there was the drought recently with the, uh, the, the media was full of horrendous pictures from Ethiopia and so forth. The, the consciousness of the American society became to focus more on that than they had throughout the period, but it's good that we keep a constant focus on that on that, well, uh, we we problem. try to uh, we try to get away from that. In mm -hmm. other words, we say that that is uh, is an expression. But what we've got to get at, in other words, the the starving baby syndrome. Mm -hmm. We try not to exploit the conditions of people. Mm -hmm. The four agencies, the Catholics, Jews, and Protestants, are very adamant on that position, mm -hmm. uh, trying to get away from exploitation of of, of the tragedy. Mm -hmm and trying to direct the mindset of the American people toward the symptoms that create the tragedy. And has that been their charge throughout? They, they, uh, the interfaith is relatively recent relative to the other agencies. Have they had that focus since the beginning of their relief uh, activities, as it were, the individual agencies, I mean? Well, we've developed that, yeah. developed that attitude. And certainly uh, into the early 80s, mm -hmm. we've as four agencies, Catholic, Jewish, Protestant, have come to an agreement that that would be our focus. The mm -hmm. focus would be on the education of the symptoms that cause the, the suffering. And that was partly the charge of the interfaith appeal then, as a sense, to uh, bring that educational task. That's that? correct. Because the to, relief activities and the, and the charity and the relief activities that have been characteristic of the relief agencies throughout the, uh, throughout the decades that they've been operating continue, but is need to have some sort of an educational pattern to the causes of that? That's correct. Uh -huh. the, uh, the four agencies have about 150 years of right. collective experience operationally in the third world in over 100 developing countries. Helping people in need without necessarily questions of politics and other things entering. And so That's forth. right. Yeah. We, we try to transcend the political issues, and we try to really... Um, represent the American will as to its humanitarian expression. Mm -hmm. And there has been a long historic tradition of American humanitarianism. There has been. Right? Oh, okay. I, think it, uh -huh. I think it goes back to the very founding of the country. The, the aspirations for which our founding fathers had was born to alleviate, um, to, to alleviate oppression and to give people an opportunity to express themselves. Mm -hmm. You don't think there was a, a new sense of that among the American people that grew out of the plights of these people that became so obvious in the media and so forth that grew from that? I, don't, I know you don't want to well, I, say exploit, I, I, but... I, I, I think that's true. I think that's true, but I think if the, the, the basis of that is inbred, is inborn in the, uh, the American experience the city on the hill kind of concept. Yeah, yeah, th that, is, uh, that is part of the, the talk that we do, but I wonder, do, do you think the United States, let's say, let's look at the United States particularly, or the West in general, has, uh, as well as we might, answered the needs of the, let's say, underclass peoples of the world, if that's the right term, or help work toward a dialogue to where the problems and scourges that plague well, and continue I, to plague the world as you and I sit and talk. I, I think you best make a distinction between governmental 
decides mm -hmm. and the will of the American people. I don't think there's any doubt in my mind that the will of the American people and the will of Western civilization is to assist their brothers and sisters in need. Others, uh, that, to me, that's irrefutable. However, when you get into the aspirations and the aims of uh, the powers to be at given times, then that can vary. I think a great deal of what we've seen uh, in the way of foreign policy and foreign assistance and developmental assistance has been a reflection of a Dulles doctrine mm. going back to the early 50s mm -hmm. in which you had the East-West confrontation. And I think a great deal of what we've done has been uh, colored by that. But I, I find that that is, is, is kind of vanishing. Mm -hmm. we, have, we have a problem in the world of uh, have, have-nots. We have people who are struggling for mere survival, as you yourself firsthand, on the ground, in the field, have experienced and seen. And we have people who are living very, very well, very, very comfortably in the West. Some of them are. Has that problem, the difference between the haves and have-nots of the world, become less, more, or stayed about the same over the last, let's say, one decade, two decades, three decades in terms of the trendings that we can see? Are the rich becoming richer and perhaps in the minds of some more callous toward the needs of the underclasses? Or is there a leveling out? Or what do you see in a broad general Well, I, again, I think you have to make a distinction. Uh, the, first of all, there's greater awareness today of the needs of others. And at the same time, uh, I think you're experiencing a global economic crisis, which uh, is disassociating the haves from the have-nots at a greater rate than it had. But at the same time, there's a greater awareness of that fact, mm -hmm. so that those who have are more sensitive to those who have not. Now, whether they can overcome the economic disadvantage, well, that's something else. You think they are more sensitive? Oh, I yes. yes. I think the uh, response 84-85 is a dramatic example mm -hmm. of the awareness and then the response to it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That was at an individual level, or was it a governmental level? Was it a oh, no, society-wide no, 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 level, no, no, that absolutely. response that you experienced? Absolutely. It was totally across social now, you were involved yourself on the ground there. Maybe you could share a little of your own experience that, you know, in that period of well, tremendous crisis. Well, uh, in 84, I uh, was in Rome mm -hmm. representing Catholic Relief Services. And I was asked to uh, go to Ethiopia and to organize an international call forward mm -hmm. representing the churches of, of the West. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I, I did. Mm -hmm. And uh, the response of that, of course, was the fact that we raised about 300,000 metric tons of food and uh, in excess of, when I consider all the agencies, in excess of $100 million mm -hmm. from private sources, non-governmental sources. That was non-governmental sources. That's correct. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, the, and the response at a governmental level or at a policy level and so forth that could address some of the, well, in the causes and long-term causes of these, are you as... Well, hopeful or sanguine in terms of the Western response to the needs of the world? There's that still happened. a long way to go that mm -hmm, way. In, mm -hmm. in other words, the, 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 the governments of the, uh, the West, and especially the United States, responded to the humanitarian needs, but did not commit or respond to the development of, the, uh, of these peoples. In other words, we have yet to make a serious commitment to the causes that keep people poor. Nor do we seem at a foreign policy level to have a system that would allow us in some cogent way to make a appeal with the causes and with the people that are at the uh, bottom of the rung, as it were, well, in the economic conditions. At a national level, we seem not to have a way of relating to the needs of the underclasses of the world. Well, that's much not less in our own country, where we allow homelessness to grow, while people live in luxury apartments and they walk by the homeless with. Well, such I'm, an I'm easy not air. so sure of that. Uh, I feel that you have freedom of the press, yes. and the press has a great uh, plays a great role mm -hmm. in developing the conscience uh, of America. And of course, 
we have found that the government does respond to the demands of the people. So when the conditions have been brought out by press, television, radio, uh, then we find that the will of the American people is expressed through its congressional representatives. Well, the will of the American press but might try to be expressed or something like that, but meanwhile, the numbers of people uh, sleeping in the Port Authority and other places around uh, this nation of ours, the, the homelessness and the problems, hunger in our very own country, family farms going out of business, problems of people, racial, racial discrimination in the ghettos, prisons filled with black people, and other kinds of problems which bespeaks a lack of concern or a lack of our ability to relate to the needs of the underclasses within our own society, much less the world, it would seem. Well, well that may be a, a temporary adjustment of, uh, of economic realities. It seems to be getting worse in the minds of Well, I, I, think, I think when you're in an adjusting period, there is a time when things kind of uh, bottom out before they, they surface again. But at the same time, I think... Uh, this is not the intention or the will of the American people or the will of the West. No, it's just the result that we see in the real world. Well, seemingly. again, I, I, I attribute this to a, a, a transitional situation. Hopefully, and not just an inability of how to direct ourselves politically, spiritually, or otherwise to the root causes that plague mankind, that we don't have a system that allows us either from spiritual, political, philosophical sources that allow us to meet the problems that confront mankind because the problems seem to grow. Well, I, I think what we've done, we've disassembled our spirituality mm -hmm. over the last 30 or 40 years mm -hmm. uh, since, the, since the war. We've become more uh, materialistic, more self-centered. And I, I find that uh, we're beginning to question the merits of that system. Mm -hmm. And we're beginning to uh, look deeper into our behavior. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm not, I'm concerned, but, but I, I find a more positive climate that I've, that I've found in a long time. Well, it certainly must have been very heartening for someone in the relief agency realm, as it were, to see this response at a private level to the needs that were so obviously there. And there must have been very heartening to see that kind of a, of a response, as you yourself saw. It, that must have been a very heartening oh, thing. Oh, it was and extraordinary. A, and it and, and li and uplifting of the human spirit. or It, it certainly it. gave you a satisfaction. I mean, yeah. I walked through fields where there were thousands, tens of thousands, not thousands, tens of thousands of people who, who were incapable of, of, of walking around and standing. Mm -hmm. A horror story. Or a it, horror. It, it, yeah. it, it was a, uh, you know, a... Uh, Series, a tragedy series, yeah. that I'll, I'll certainly never forget. Yeah, and then you were at the same time able to see response that was able to help in the alleviation of that, which you saw to be in the best uh, example I, of the human I, spirit, I, which gives you this more sanguine, perhaps, view of the, the I human was there condition. when we could not help them, mm -hmm. when mm -hmm. there was nothing. We had nothing in country. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then I was there when I saw the response. Uh -huh. and the response was tremendous. All right, yeah. But again, the response, our response cannot continue to just be to tragic situations. We've got to develop thoughtfulness and cooperation and structures that can address themselves to the symptoms. To the symptoms and then to policies that could help in the long-term alleviation of the conditions that create these. That's correct. Conditions. And yeah. until you do that, then I don't think there is a, uh, you know, one mm. may question your, the seriousness or the genuineness uh, of, of, of your response. Uh -huh. What we need, certainly in Africa, which I consider yeah. a, a threatened continent, yeah. we may be uh, facing, for the first time in history, a whole continent which yeah. is itself threatened for a variety of reasons. Uh, disease, hunger, ecology, yeah. population, mm -hmm. productivity, all kinds of water, mm -hmm. uh, a lack of forestry. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, it's uh, plus all the political machinations that go on. So un unless we, the developed world, 
uh, commit ourselves, I think, in terms of 50 years. Right. Not for two or three years, mm -hmm. or not uh, to have a concert mm -hmm. and raise uh, 50 million dollars. These are things people try to do and help as best they can within the structural limitations. That's right. That are there? Yeah. You know, the singing of "We Are the World" mm -hmm. was was a wonderful thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, provided, because it's the first time, really, I think that we addressed ourselves to the fact that we are the world. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's great to sing about yeah, it, mm -hmm. but now we've got to begin to act as though we are the world. Mm -hmm. We've got to believe mm -hmm. in, in that song. And when you say we, we as a people, we as a system need to be able to do that, or we the as we, individuals the and we institutions The we being the developed are, world. Mm -hmm, right. This is not an American uh, uh, problem. Mm -hmm. This is a global problem. Mm -hmm. This is a world problem. You know, we are members of this thing called planet Earth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And until we begin to respond in, in, in that manner, then this you is know, just an exercise in the ego. You spoke earlier about the human spirit responding to that and your sense of, uh, of, of there being a, 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 a richness of the human spirit and so forth. If people feel that way and feel that need to have some compassion and help and this sort of thing, and then the governmental systems or the systems of uh, international communication and so forth do not in any kind of a way allow them to participate in some active way, do not allow them to see their government representation participating in a way that is alleviating the problems and so forth. It creates a sort of schizophrenia and a, a, a desire to not be concerned with it because it's well, too horrendous to face. I, I, I there's a problem it, that you want to address and there's no way for you to address well, it. Well, I think it creates a frustration. Because your leadership will not it allow it. It creates a frustration, but that frustration is then uh, manifest at the polls and you see changes in government uh -huh. and you see changes in attitude. <clears throat> And uh, issue, does the issue play well? Does the issue play well in elections? We had an election in 1984 where I, that issue was brought think, up and I, people seem not to care. I don't think it plays about, well on an international level, but when it begins to affect citizens, mm -hmm. cities, yeah. port authorities. Right here in the United yes. States. Uh -huh, uh -huh. When you begin to see that, then that is a microcosmic expression of what's happening in the global situation. And of course, the kind of hunger and poverty that you experience here, you cannot translate in terms of third world. Well, that's a problem, because if you have it right there where you have to walk by it and you see it daily, the thing is, it is going on in Africa. It is going in other places that are distant from you. You want to be able to relate to it. Again, people get very inured of walking past people sleeping on the streets when they realize or think that they realize that there's really nothing much they can do about it, which is a problem of human psychology and the human spirit. Well, I, I don't believe that. I think uh, there, uh, there, uh, there is a, there's a great deal that the individual can do. All right, fine. We wanted to talk. We have to take, if you don't mind, we have to take a little break now. I want to come back, and I know you brought back some footage that you were in Ethiopia recently that we want to show the people, but uh, we have to take a little break right now, and we invite you in the te television audience to stay tuned. Uh, we're, coming, we're coming right back with Monsignor call of the International um, uh, Hunger Appeal. Please stay tuned. We're coming right back. This man is a slave to cocaine. He's not addicted to using it. He's addicted to growing it. Because growing the coca is one of the few ways he can keep his family from going hungry. Hunger causes a world of problems. You can help prevent it. Contact Interfaith Hunger Appeal, Box 1000, FDR Station, New York. Haiti, Ethiopia, Laos, Cambodia, El Salvador, Mozambique. Many of the world's wars aren't fought by people who are hungry for power. They're fought by people who are just plain hungry. Hunger causes a world of problems. You can help prevent it. Contact Interfaith Hunger Appeal, Box 1000, FDR Station, New York. again now with Monsignor Cole, and we were talking before that this question of whether or not there are means for people to respond and so forth, 
whether we do have a sense of that response. Is it a matter of the leadership providing a means to which the people can repair, or, or is it well, possible for people to feel a sense of positive involvement in these things, even if the leadership is not responding? To well, I, I think uh, the '84, '85 experience with regard to Ethiopia is a perfect example of that, right. where there was an expression on the part of the American people which was not totally in sympathy with the. Uh, let's say, national security package mm -hmm. that concerned itself mm -hmm. to uh, Ethiopia. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And at that time, we saw that attitude change. In your literature, you say that the problem isn't, and you said in your opening remarks, it's not an act of God, it's not only the climate, it has to do with the fact that we live in an age or an era where we know how to produce sufficient food for all people in the world. We know how to fish produce sufficiency for all the people in the world in a very real sense. It does have to do down, come down to policies and will and the human spirit and will. These are the basic questions which get in the way of there being an <coughs> yes, appropriate... Yes, but it, it's not only our problem. Though. All right. See, it's, it's, not a, it's not solely an American problem. No. By, no. In, in any ways, mm -hmm. there is a certain responsibility on the part of the government of, of these nations that are in need oh, absolutely. to adapt themselves and to upgrade themselves to a point where they can satisfy the needs of the people. All right, yeah. But at the same time, there's also the, the, uh, the, the role of the individual. Mm -hmm. For example, if uh, uh, the situation in Ethiopia where you have a, com a, maybe not a complete, but certainly a, a serious deterioration of the ecology of the country. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, how, how has that come about? Mm -hmm. And what can you do to change that? Mm -hmm. Well, you cannot have millions of, of people uh, not participating in a, a kind of agricultural system mm -hmm. which can respond to their needs. Mm -hmm. You can't have them tearing down and burning uh, their forests. Mm -hmm. As they might traditionally do. Mm -hmm. That's correct. Yeah. Uh -huh. According to uh, semi-nomadic uh, cultures, uh -huh. for example. Yeah. Now, it's true, you have to preserve the, those cultures, but at the same time, there must be a way of introducing a, a, a sensitivity mm -hmm. in those cultures for the fact that that they are endangering uh, their very existence by some of their practices. I hear what you're saying there. It is easy, it is, we want to be guaranteeing those things, but you also want to be careful not to be blaming necessarily the victim <laughs> for a condition that they find themselves in and saying it's their fault, they should pull themselves up only by their own bootstraps. We have to be sensitive to the fact that the system itself and well, which people find themselves make it difficult for them to do it, either on a third world scale or here in our own country, the underclass, underprivileged people in our own situation as well. Well, if, uh, if you know what I'm saying. Yeah. Yes. But it is a balance, yes. of course. Yeah. Yeah. You, you, can't, you cannot blame entirely the victim. The victim. Yeah. You, Which you people have, are want to do all that. Well, that's, that, that's an oversimplification. Yes, we also right. have to look at our international trade. Mm -hmm. We have to look at international debt, mm -hmm. international investments, mm -hmm. see? Mm -hmm. and, and we have to adjust our means of operation, mm -hmm. you know, the profit motivation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we cannot develop our own lifestyle mm -hmm. on the backs of, of the punished poor. Mm -hmm. And as some people think we may have been doing. Uh, well, uh, but certainly there is a vast and growing disproportion between the haves and the have-nots. So. In some sense, we've got, to, we've got to fine-tune the economy or the economic practices mm -hmm. that have served the developed world well. Mm -hmm. I mean, if we, can, if we can enhance our own lifestyle to such a degree, mm -hmm. then uh, knowing how to do it and doing it for ourselves, then why not include more people? Well, that would be an interesting question. It has to, that begins to get into the realm of politics and so forth. I wonder if maybe we could. You have brought back with you from a recent trip, Christmas time, as I understand, Correct. to Ethiopia. You have a, a short film clip that you uh, that you put together there. We'd like to take a look at that, if you, if you don't mind. Maybe you could set it up for us. You were there in when? I was there. Uh, I returned to uh, in New York on the 22nd of December. Mm-hmm. And we had a briefing at the United Nations uh, Church Center, mm -hmm. in which we uh, we uh, shared with the media uh, what we 
experienced in Ethiopia. Uh, we did it on the basis of two things. First of all, we evaluated the what we call the early warning signs of, yeah. of, uh, of famine. And we also took a look at the programs uh, that were put in place by our respective ages, agencies in response to 84, 85. I see. Developmental uh -huh. programs, uh -huh. which were absolutely extraordinary. Uh huh. Okay, well, fine. Why don't we run the tape? It was about four minutes or so. About four And minutes. then we can come, that'll give us some things to talk about about Ethiopia as we come back for that. So we invite you now, we're, we'll run the tape now that was shot in just December of last year. Then, December that? 21, December 22, 23. December 21. 20. 21, 22. Right to that, just before Christmas of 1987 in Ethiopia. Okay, let's uh, run that tape now then, please. Tens of thousands of people are lining up daily in Ethiopia to wait for the food that will keep them alive. The latest United Nations estimate is that more than 5 million people will require food aid and assistance in 1988. More than a million tons of food is needed, while only a third of that amount has been promised by donor nations. The reason for the emergency is once again a devastating drought, which has virtually wiped out this year's food supply, especially in the northern provinces of Eritrea and Tigray. Aid contributed through four U.S. agencies which cooperate in the interfaith hunger appeal is already arriving in Ethiopia where it is immediately transferred to regional centers for distribution. Food is given to families in order that they can return to their home villages and not remain in the huge and unhealthy camps of 1984. Four agencies cooperate in the interfaith hunger appeal. Church World Service, Catholic Relief Services, Lutheran World Relief, and the American Jewish Joint Distribution Committee. A famine alert team representing the four organizations went to Ethiopia December 13th through 19th, 1987 to assess the need and to evaluate programs that are supported through these organizations. People are hungry, even though the tragic consequences of the famine that stirred people to action in 1984 have not yet occurred. Without immediate help from the international community, these consequences will return, and there is not much time. The Famine Alert Team found that partner organizations in Ethiopia have worked since 1984 to develop permanent projects that will help cope with this new emergency, but more importantly, will help to avoid future catastrophes. Only long-term development will prevent recurring crises. 1,500 workers are building a dam 41 feet high and 1,000 feet across without heavy equipment. As part of a food for work project, it will eventually help to irrigate the whole area and thus increase the food supply. Warehouses are built out of permanent materials which can be picked up from the ground. When these structures are not needed to store emergency food, they will be used as classrooms and training facilities. A fleet of trucks is available to help distribute food, seed, fertilizer, and other necessities to remote villages. Transportation of the food will be less of a problem this time. A garage has been built where trucks can be repaired. The roads take a heavy toll, and the trucks constantly need repair. Young people are also trained as mechanics as part of the program. Permanent clinics have replaced the makeshift tents in order to provide long-term health care. They are also better able to meet the health problems which result from famine. Seeds, tools, fertilizers, and the training of village farmers have resulted in increased crop yields in the years when the rains come. These are a few examples the team found of the commitment to long-term development which grew out of the 1984 emergency. They now make it possible to reduce the potential tragedy in the present drought. 
The international community faces the challenge to respond to the current crisis even more generously than it did in 1984. At the same time that emergency needs are met, long-term development needs will be expanded. A 50-year commitment to development is needed in order to stop the recurring tragedies of the drought. Back again, that was incredible. And it's interesting because it, it does give, uh, as you say, you had some of these semi-nomadic tribesmen and so forth, part of what, from your experience, having been on the ground, early warning systems of trouble that's likely to be coming. There's lack of rainfall in the north and so forth. Is yes. That? When uh, we took a team, uh, representatives from Lutheran World Relief Church World Service, from the American Jewish Joint Distribution, and from Catholic Relief Service, we mm -hmm. took representative each. And we went and we visited, especially we traveled heavily in the north. Mm -hmm. And what we're looking for are the signs. In other words, you don't yeah. want to wait till the thing falls apart. No, let's not. Okay? No. So, uh, what are some of the things you look for? You look for uh, uh, the amount of water in riverbeds. Mm -hmm. And we found that it was receding in the riverbeds. In 1984, 85, there was no, there were, weren't even puddles. Right, okay. It was just burnout. Mm -hmm. You look for the condition of the soil, pulver, pulverized, tired. Mm -hmm. uh, you, the green is beginning to disappear. Vegetation is, yeah. is dying. Mm -hmm. uh, you look for uh, the cost of food. Mm -hmm. What does food cost? In, in uh, six weeks prior to December 20th, mm -hmm. so going back into, uh, into late October, uh, uh, late October, early November, the price of food had tripled. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, another indication, the cost of uh, farm animals mm -hmm. had dropped, had been cut in half in less than six weeks. What is in that? other words, yeah. people were dumping the farm animals, uh -huh. which happened in 84, 85. And the people who were there on the ground and the people who've lived in that climate and so forth and lived in that area sensed, and you sensed it in your discussion with Absolutely. them, troubles coming. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. For example, we went into a, a town of Wukro, uh, in the north. And there we found that uh, a month before we had been uh, getting food assistance to 35,000 people, now it was up over 100,000. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Almost again tripled. Right. So right. you mm -hmm. found this urgency. Now what we try and do is we try and give a month's supply of food, mm -hmm. 125 pounds basically of food to each family. Mm -hmm. Now, that had tripled. You found, uh, when you looked into the uh, warehouses, mm -hmm. you found there was, uh, the warehouses were about 15 to 20 percent full. So you sensed, you knew that the food supply in the country was diminishing and diminishing rapidly, especially mm -hmm. with this influx. Mm -hmm. Another early warning sign would be the semi-nomadic tribes, yes. who normally are extremely independent can live off of with very little, mm -hmm. you found them coming into the, into the cities and into the major uh, villages. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And so you knew then so these that are, you were on to something. All right. Now, given our experience in 84 and 85, given our experience that we have systems in place that we ought well to be able to take advantage of our experience to, in order to, in a certain distant early warning system, uh, not let the situation get so out of hand as it had previously. That's, that's Is correct. that one of the... Absolutely. The, the idea is to keep, to develop a food security mm -hmm. so that people can remain in their villages mm -hmm. and at the same time get them seeds and get them uh, a, uh, mm -hmm. agricultural tools mm -hmm. which will help them become self-sufficient. We don't want to let the camps develop, which developed in 84, 85, where you had hundreds of thousands of people coming to centers and dependent upon the dole. How widespread is this? Is it going up into East it's Sudan and so forth? Is it uh, how, how wide, geographically? Yes, yes. Uh, you have, a, uh, I would say, 40 to 45 percent of the problem would be in the north. Mm -hmm. Now, you have to keep in mind, not only has there been zero rainfall in there, mm -hmm. in that area, mm -hmm. but you've also had a war going on for 25 years. It's horrible. I know. Yeah, I know. Yeah. And all that goes with that, which becomes extremely political. Now, what can be done 
uh, by, let's say, the citizens of the United States or the Western world, involving our governmental leadership, they could, in a certain sense, in your view, act responsibly, stave off the worst effects of this which we can see coming? Well, I think we have to operate on two levels. Number one, we, uh, and which, by the way, the United States uh, presently is, has, has been exemplary in its, in its response well, in good. one area, mm -hmm. especially the relief area. Mm -hmm. uh, while we were in Ethiopia, uh, the uh, USAID uh, director uh, announced that 115,000 metric tons more would be given uh, to, to the cause. Is there the way to distribute it all right? You have transportation problems and so forth? There's because of 84-85, the structures for distribution are there. Mm -hmm. one, of the, one of the weak points is the transportation situation. Mm -hmm. We're still in need of at least 322-ton trucks. Th that you must have. You're still in need of a uh, committed, a committed uh, international food supply. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean, the United States, it's not a United States responsibility alone. It's a responsibility of the international community. It would be good for us here in the United States to try and take a lead in that if we can. Well, I think we're doing that yeah. right now. Which, in 84, 85, we were playing hardball because of po politics. Mm -hmm. But we have had a much more thoughtful, much more mature, much more responsive program in, uh, in 87, 88 mm -hmm. in Ethiopia. However, the point that is the problem is the fact that we, uh, the West and the United States, have not committed ourselves to a developmental program. Mm -hmm. For example, we have laws on the books in the United States, Hickenlooper Amendment, for example, which does not enable us to give developmental assistance to uh, Marxist-aligned countries. Mm -hmm. We even send conquerors and things so, in some cases. Yeah. Well, Go ahead. Part, 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 part of the inconsistency. Mm -hmm. Here we have this tremendous humanitarian expression in terms of relief. But what we really need is developmental assistance. Mm -hmm. And I'm not talking about uh, a five or 10 year commitment. I'm talking about a 50 year commitment. Well, again, you don't think we're talking about a philosophy that allows us to resonate with or be appreciative of and have policies that allow us to be concerned effectively with the needs of the poor around the world. Many of the people of the world think that we do not. We're concerned only with well, I, questions of individual freedom that allow people to rise to the top, and we don't care about the let the devil take the hindmost. Again, I think that. that's an uh, unfortunate perception. Not, perhaps not at the level of the individual, uh, but well, at the level I, I, of I'm speaking. Government expression. I, I'm speaking. That's where we're directing our attention. Mm -hmm. Our attention is to educate that humanitarian concern, which we feel is instinctive in the American people, mm -hmm. to educate that concern to taking care of the things that cause and perpetuate poverty, which leads to hunger. Okay, fine. And then that might be, if we are, after all, in a presidential election year, maybe it'd be something that could be brought up well into the presidential election debate, as it were, in order for our leadership to provide some uh, answers to these questions that the citizens themselves would have and address those problems uh, in terms of this, uh, you know, in terms of their presidential candidates' position. Well, I, so I, I, you know, it should be part of the, the, the dialogue here in the United I, States. I would certainly hope. Mm. that that would be a major concern because it is affecting life in America. Because as we read the newspapers and we read the debate so far, there hasn't been a great deal of discussion of this, and it might be good that in a distant early warning way, your activities are helping to raise consciousness among the general society to this problem, which in our long-run interest of this country, we have to address, and it should maybe percolate up to our leadership, as it were, that we'd see increasingly. And I'm, we want to come back to that if we can. Sorry, we have to take another break here now. Maybe we can come back to exactly that point after, after the break. It's your pleasure, the Perception Monsignor Cole, Cole, Call, uh, uh, Executive Director of the Interfaith Hunger Appeal. Please stay tuned. We'll be, coming, we'll be coming right back. Thank you. Every day, around the world, millions of people go out to eat. They don't go across town. They go across borders. Because leaving their countries is one of the only ways 
they can keep their families from going hungry. Hunger causes a world of problems. You can help prevent it. Contact Interfaith Hunger Appeal, Box 1000, FDR Station, New York. Do you have your passport? <laughs> For the third time, yes. Do you have everything? Kids, relax. <laughs> if we weren't grown-ups, they wouldn't have let us join the Peace Corps. Peace Corps is creating food systems in Africa, building homes in Costa Rica, and fighting malaria in Asia. It's teaching math and learning French. It's working side by side. It's been tough. But for 25 years, the Peace Corps has been making a difference in the world. Mom, Dad, oh. I'm so proud of you. Peace Corps, the toughest job you'll ever love. with Monsignor Cole, and we were talking about the fact that this, uh, this, this, this question of the need to have a policy relating to this question is one that well ought to be risen to uh, serious consideration of the presidential debate. Well, in 84, 85, we had a tremendous uh, invasion of United States congressmen, senators, and, uh, and representatives uh, into Ethiopia. And uh, because of them, uh, the response of the uh, uh, American government dramatically changed. Well, I was just saying, it, it doesn't seem to be up in the, you know, so far there hasn't been much discussion of that within the, con you know, within the presidential debates that we've had thus far. Well, I, I, I think that's part of an evolutionary process. I well, think we've got to get going. I mean, well, it's time, you know? right now, maybe they're involved with recognition, but they are also bringing up economic issues. Mm -hmm. And, for example, indebtedness. Uh -huh. And indebtedness is directly, uh, directly affects uh, the poor of the world. Uh -huh. For example, uh, the, uh, the increasing debt in the third world yeah. has reduced the income of the poor by 25%. Uh -huh. Now, yeah, if, you're, rates, yeah. if you're in Ethiopia uh -huh. and your uh, average income is $110, uh -huh. Uh -huh. if that has been reduced 25%, uh -huh. You see what's happening. Annual income? Yeah. Annual yeah. income. Yeah. Uh -huh. Annual yeah. income. Yeah, 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 yeah. That would force people to do all kinds of things in order to survive and so forth. Uh, uh, yeah, right, yeah, yeah. Oh, and that's because of the high interest rates now, and the debt. Now, how has uh, it has uh, it has been stated by the World Bank mm -hmm. that the uh, capability uh, in the uh, developed world has been reduced approximately a seventh? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But in the underdeveloped world, the effect has been tremendous. It's, it's still that these economic calamities fall hardest on the poor around oh, the world. Always. Always the ones who suffer the most for the errors of the dukes and so forth who make the for mistakes. For the miscalculations very and for the incidents of greed. So the degree, the incidences of greed, which again seems to be uh, at least perhaps currently or seen by many to, to be there, so that the issues Specific issues, specific acts of uh, specific legislative proposals, specific acts that could allow those ongoing programs to continue that you were aware of, that to allow those infrastructure things that are in place to function, specific positions that the president, the executive, or the congressional leadership could take. Are there specific instances, specific bills, things that could be supported by the American people that would allow us to develop an appropriate foreign policy stance toward this issue that you're so concerned with? Oh, absolutely. I think we've got to change some of the legislation that prohibits us from uh, giving humanitarian developmental assistance to people in need. Mm -hmm. And until we get those uh, laws off the books, and again, they're a reflection of something that happened back in the, the late 40s and 50s. What will it take to do us, for us to do that? And why isn't such a thing being addressed by our... Uh presidential candidate why aren't they being addressed those questions well I, I think basically be, I think be, basically because issues beyond our shores ha have not emerged and may not emerge they're more concerned with national issues and uh, unfortunately there are a number of large and uh, very visible national issues even with there, regard to poverty. Even though there is even though there is this response at a spiritual level on the individual citizens level about these questions that ought to be reflected and presumably would find a response 
uh, to uh, in, in the people to government leadership that would address those issues. I think it's felt deeply spiritually. I, perhaps. I think eventually it will. Uh -huh. But we, we in this I, presidential election, I mean, will it surface? Will these things come so that the national dialogue will move toward that direction? I think the concern is. for local poverty will be an, an issue. That might be an impetus. Which will give birth to a concern for global poverty and hunger. Do you think there's sufficient interest in, uh, in, in local poverty being uh, manifest in the presidential election and di political dialogue that's going on now? As we listen to it, it's developing. We're in the middle of a, pr a presidential election year. Well, I don't think it has developed to the intensity that we would like it. Uh -huh. But I, I, I think it's beginning to emerge. And I think as you're... Uh, as those who run for a post begin to, some will emerge, mm -hmm. uh, then you will see a more sophisticated approach, I think, to the, to the poverty issue. Didn't play well in 48. The concern for the underclasses didn't play well, didn't win any votes, and uh, the nation went... In, in 48? Different... In 84, oh. I'm sorry, in 84. I didn't play well the concern for the uh, well, I don't poor think that, of this country. Well, or... I, I don't think that was, uh, that was the concern at the time. Mm -hmm. I think the, the concern for, at the time was a, a role of leadership mm -hmm. role. Mm -hmm. I, I don't, uh, but I think now. Yeah. Maybe it would, and maybe your activity and the work of the interfaith might help the nation move that way that does well for us to move that way. It's in our own interest to develop a sense of... Uh, of, uh, of a way of meaningfully addressing these problems of poverty in the world level, not only, not only just at the, the need of the people there, we need to have some sort of a direction for spiritual values or for a sense of national worth and so forth, maybe getting away from some of the greed and some of the self-centeredness and so forth, if we had a more realistically compassionate national view of the world, don't, don't you think? I mean, oh, uh, it's I, in our own national interest to develop a sense of that. It's, it's not only in our national interest. It, only, it not only befits and, and uh, uh, is complementary to, to our national security, mm -hmm. but it, it, it's also a fulfillment of our own security as, as an individual. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Yeah, right, okay. Uh, if we are so filled with self, mm -hmm then we have nowhere to go. That's right. It's only when you empty of yourself and you, you begin to see beyond yourself mm -hmm. that you really become fulfilled. I think maybe that's what I was addressing, that we as a nation and the ethos, and uh, there was a poll recently taken, the young people in this country are not really so much concerned as they were with developing a philosophy of life as they are with uh, gaining income and money and self uh, Concern. They were very self-directed, self-concerned. Uh, yes, but I've and, also uh, I've also seen polls which say that uh, the young are disenchanted with the materialism of uh, uh, of their predecessors. I wish I saw more of those polls. I wish I could see more of those polls and indications of that uh, that they are, and that there are well, options to that. Well, that let, the leadership is. Let, let me give you an example uh, in our own way. Interfaith hunger appeal. All right. All right. We have uh, now developed a situation with Colgate University, University mm -hmm. of Notre Dame, Valparaiso, uh, also assistance from Cornell and from Brandeis. Mm -hmm to develop workshop for, for university professors All right. in sensitizing them so that they will develop curriculum for students on an interdisciplinary basis. Mm -hmm. In other words, take hunger and poverty out of the areas of theology, philosophy, sociology, mm -hmm. but develop a courses of instruction which appeal to the accountant to the engineer, to the doctor, give, give a general education experience to, to the coming generation about of hunger and poverty related issues and put it in their course core curriculum. Yes. And that is being underwritten by private enterprise. To sensitize them to those problems that exist in the world Correct. or to help them in a curriculum development that could help alleviate these problems, which? To sensitize them to the issues. The idea, first, if they're sensitive to the issues, then hopefully they will respond to the issues. If there are ways in which they are able to respond sufficiently and in a national direction. That's the point. We are trying to provoke a thoughtfulness amongst the young mm -hmm. that they will rethink 
present economic practices mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that will be more responsive and include more people in the system mm -hmm. which presently is disenfranchising more and more people. The system is disenfranchising people. The system is more and more materialistic. It's encouraging a more and more materialistic, selfish, greed-oriented kind of direction. And the young people increasingly, you were going to find a way for them to participate in that kind of a system? No. Or we're going to change that system? We are. If we're not going to change Is we the leadership are, going to change it? We or are going what? to develop a citizenry yeah. which will be more sensitive to those who are not participating in the system. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And in that way, we will also be developing a politique that will be more responsive to the needs of the disenfranchised. Uh -huh. Without, within the system rather than some alternative outside of or extra to the major leadership positions in the system, we, it see, would be, we can transform the system and the thinking of the nation from a greed-oriented, materialistic economy and so forth that it currently seems to be to one that is more feeling and so forth? Or would they have to be outside of that system? No, they would, be, they would participate so the, in that system. So many, of, so many you, of the relief agencies had to act outside of the main thrust of that system. Not necessarily true. We could mm -hmm. not do mm -hmm. what mm -hmm. has been done around the world mm -hmm. were it not for the humanitarian expression of the government of the United States and of the Western world. I'm happy you to don't hear see that. any expression mm -hmm. of humanitarian ism at all on the part of communist countries. You don't. None. You do not see any None. of that. None whatsoever. None right? whatsoever. Oh, well, it's, so then it's an it's a, it's an experience almost unknown. Mm -hmm. It's interesting that who is feeding Russia? Who is feeding Russia with excess grain and through sure. grain? Sure. Yeah, sure. through the through the through the extra that trade of grain to the Soviet Union and so mm -hmm. forth like that. Yeah, so we are. So we have an excess of grain that we have made a deal to trade with mm -hmm. them. But you feel that we are leading in terms of having a humanitarian expression and an outreach to the, the United States class peoples of the world? The United yeah. States, no. The United States is probably 13th or 14th in the world in its humanitarian expressions. Uh -huh. But no, no communist country is above that. You're, you're looking at people uh, like Holland and uh, Sweden, uh, the Scandinavian countries, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and uh, a great many uh, expressions coming out of Western Europe, mm -hmm. where the uh, per capita commitment to humanitarianism is greater than ours. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, I mean, we're not in this alone by mm -hmm. any means. Nonetheless, if you put the dollar impact or the tonnage impact, there's no one that can even, you know, come close to, mm -hmm. to what is being done by the United States. It is interesting, isn't it, then? Because in a, in a political dialectic or in a Marxian dialectic, they would claim, at least in an ideological level, to be talking to and be addressing primarily not perhaps the sense of individual freedom as we might in the... West for people to be able to develop their own way, but the needs and the the of the proletariat of the underclass in an ideological sense. Mr. Gorbachev has given the world great heart by rethinking the Soviet position in the world, both geopolitically and economically and so forth, to move towards some more individualism and so forth. But they do have, at least at an ideological level, that as a stated belief. You think that they just do not live up to that belief, the Marxist it, ha it hasn't been it has, expressed. It has won. It the, has not been expressed. But it has been able to win the allegiance in, of a good proportion of the world's population by oppression. To that view by oppression. Well, in some. In other words, no. If you, if but you, the United States has worked. I mean, the imperialist press uh, courses of the West have been oppressive. Unfortunately, upon third world people. Unfortunately, as well. we have done the same. Do you think maybe However, there, need a there, is, uh, there is an ability on our part to address ourselves to that. Yeah, uh, Mr. Gorbachev... There is, is none in the other system. Yeah, well, Mr. Gorbachev has asked the Soviet citizens to do that. One doesn't want to be too sanguine. They have taken a thoroughgoing look at their system, at least proposed that and so forth. One wonders if we, A, need to, or if we have been by our leadership called to take a fundamental look at the assumptions that have undergirded our society in the last... Uh, I don't know, 10, 20 years or so that have led us to the condition where we are in terms of this and whether or not that kind of a call is not something that's called for for us to 
in our own interests? Well, n number one, I, I think it is part of, uh, of our heritage to, to do that. And number two, I do think uh, recently there has not been a great call on the part of leadership to right. do that. Well, that's what I was saying. But mm -hmm. we also have the process that enables us to, to address that. Mm -hmm. We do not have to wait for a leader who comes by once or twice in a century mm -hmm. to do that. We have within our own system the chance of regenerating ourselves. Mm -hmm. And that's the beauty of the system. Well, I would like to hope that is the case. We have a, we have a situation where the, the ownership of the means of production in our American economy, we have a political democracy. The ownership is very, very narrowly concentrated in a very small group of people who are the primary decision makers in terms of our society. And we have a great deal of rethinking to do. We have people employed that are still on a poverty level. We have an, uh, problems of unemployment and these kind of uh, unemployment and poverty that we have. Underemployment rather than. Underemployment. We have people employed that still are under poverty level. We have uh, racism increasing. We have prisons full of race. We have a great number of problems here that we ought to address. Well, that's the breakdown of the spirit, I think. Yeah, and that we have a breakdown, of it, but we ought to rethink our own situation in order to gain a more appropriate view of the real challenges to the human spirit that the contemporary moment uh, present. And it's an incredibly challenging time, one which calls for change on the part of all of us. And one of the things that we certainly ought to develop are all the kinds of things that, if I may say so, the interfaith hunger appeal has been encouraging us to think about in the leadership and the society. And I want to congratulate you and all of your colleagues on the work and wish you all the very best. And thank you for helping to call our attention to this very, very important question that confronts not only the peoples of that developing world, but here in the United States as well. It's been a pleasure. It's been a pleasure talking Peace. with you. It's been a pleasure having the perception, for you to have the perceptions of Monsignor Robert Cole, who is the executive director of this extremely interesting organization, Interfa Interfaith Hunger Appeal, addressing uh, issues that are of, uh, of, the, of, of the moment. Happy to be able to bring you those perceptions. We invite you to tune in again next week here on Conversations. We'll be coming back. That's it for this particular segment. Monsignor Cole, once again, thank you very much indeed. Our pleasure. Good night. We'll see you next week. <laughs>